Welcome back. Now we're on 18.11, Occurrence, Preparation, and Properties of Halogens. So we're going to talk about all this for halogens and for some halogen compounds. So all of our halogens occur naturally in seawater as halide ions, so Cl minus, Br minus. Um, halide salts tend to be the best sources of them except for iodine. Um, their ions can be oxidized from the iodide or bromide to their free diatomic halogen molecules. Uh, but fluorine is the hardest to do this for, and with iodine being the easiest. Uh, we produce fluorine uh, via electrolytic oxidation. So this is done by taking a molten mixture of potassium hydrogen fluoride and anhydrous hydrogen fluoride. And when they're combined, they give us uh, some fluorine gas. Uh, chlorine is produced by the electrolysis of the chloride ion in an aqueous sodium chloride solution, which we talked about before, called the chloralkali process. Um, there is another reaction that we can look at to make chlorine, where we do chemical oxidation of the chloride ion in an acid solution with a strong oxidizing agent such as manganese dioxide or sodium dichromate. So we're going to look at the reaction with manganese in just a second. So we've got our manganese dioxide, which is a solid, and we add this to some aqueous chloride ion in some acid. And we get from this Mn2+, and we've now oxidized the chloride to chlorine gas and given off some water as well. Bromine is commercially prepared by oxidizing the bromide ion by chlorine, so chlorine would much rather be the chloride ion, so um, I guess this should be bromide, not bromine. So if we take this aqueous bromide and add some chlorine, uh, the chlorine's going to go and say, no, I want to be negatively charged, um, and bromine you can take off as Br2. And so, boom, now we've made bromine, and we have some aqueous chloride ion left over. Um, iodine can be made by oxidation of iodine chloride or iodic acid. Uh, commercially, it tends to be made by reducing sodium iodate with sodium hydrogen sulfite. So we're going to look at the ionic equation for this with the iodate ion, which is IO3 minus. And so this is then reacted with uh, the... Uh, hydrogen sulfite ion, HSO3 minus, and these react to give us HSO4 minus, so hydrogen sulfate, um, as well as regular sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, and water, and then finally we get iodine, or iodine, I2. Um, some people say iodine, some say iodine, it means the same thing. Um, one thing that you should note when it comes to the properties of our halogens is the easier it is to oxidize the halide, the more difficult it is for that halogen to act as an oxidizing agent. So, um, for instance, iodine is the easiest to oxidize, which means it's the weakest um, of the halogens as an oxidizing agent. So we're going to talk about some properties individually, starting with fluorine. It is a pale yellow gas at room temperature, and the most powerful oxidizing agent that is of our known elements. It can form binary fluorides with every element except helium, neon, and argon. A lot of substances ignite when they come into contact with it, and it is the only element that can actually react with xenon, and it forms stable compounds with it. Um, now chlorine at room temperature is kind of a greenish yellow gas and a strong oxidizing agent, but not as strong as fluorine. Uh, when you stick it in cold water, it undergoes a disproportionation, disproportionation, I just cannot say that word right, uh, reaction. Um, so it's go it uh, breaks apart then into uh, hypochlorous acid um, and the chloride ion. So half of them oxidize and the other half reduce. So we take our Cl2. Uh, put it in some water, cold water, 
and we get hypochlorous acid, HOCl, um, some H3O plus, since now we've got some acid in there, and then the other half is reduced to Cl minus. Um, interestingly enough, the hypochlorous acid solution can undergo photochemical decomposition when it's exposed to light. So this, there is a second reaction that can occur. So if it's still in solution with the water, um, you can get some sunlight on it and then it's going to decompose to acid, more chloride ions, and oxygen gas. So here's that reaction here. Um, while I'm writing this, um, the oxidizing capabilities of, of uh, chlorine make it a very um, valuable tool for commercial and industrial oxidation um, because it's pretty uh, widespread and cheap to manufacture as well. Come on, switch slides now, there we go. Okay, so bromine uh, tends to be a deep reddish brown liquid with a high vapor pressure. It's slightly soluble in water, um, but very miscible, pretty much completely miscible when you have something with lower polarity, especially nonpolar solvents, um, it's pretty much infinitesimally miscible with them. Um, it has very similar compounds to chlorine, but it is uh, a weaker oxidizing agent and it's less reactive than chlorine. Um, iodine is kind of this purplish, grayish black crystalline solid with a high vapor pressure. So both iodine and, and bromine with these high vapor pressures, that means when you look at them, you'll notice there's actually kind of a cloud of gas or vapor above them. Um, so bromine has, kind of has this reddish gas above it. Iodine has this purpley gray uh, gas above it. And the crystals of iodine sublime when you add just a little bit of heat um, and it's this beautiful deep violet vapor that uh, sublimes. So sublimation, remember, is when it goes from uh, solid to gas directly. Um, iodine tends to be soluble in hydrocarbons and slightly soluble in water. Um, interestingly enough, it can actually be soluble in iodide, I minus solutions, and forms these kind of brown, these brown solutions. And this is because there's an empty valence d orbital in iodine, uh, which allows it to act as a Lewis acid towards the iodide ion. Iodine is the least reactive of the halogens and thus the weakest oxidizing agent. It does have a slight reaction with water and it can react with starch and iodide ion and this will form a very deep blue color in water. And in fact, this is actually a test that is used in the biochemistry world um, as a test for starch. You add an iodine solution and see if you get this deep blue color. It's almost black actually. So here's a picture showing you uh, chlorine on the left, bromine in the center, and iodine on the far right. So you can see chlorine is this pale gas. Um, ga bromine has this um, gaseous orange vapor above it, and the iodine has that purpley brown vapor above it due to their high vapor pressures. Um, now we can form halides of our representative metals. These tend to be binary halides, and these are very important salts. Um, for instance, sodium chloride is a binary halide of sodium and chlorine. And just to remind you, sodium salts are ionic compounds composed of cations and anions, other than hydroxide or oxide ions. Um, if you have just a binary uh, halide where you have a metal and halogen, these are called halides. Um, most of them are, are ionic, but when you have a halide with mercury or group 13 elements that are in their three plus oxidation state or tin four or lead four, these are actually covalent binary halides. So up to this point, we basically said if it's a metal and non-metal, it's ionic, but there actually are exceptions and some of them are covalent binary halides. Um, we can generally form them by direct reaction, not direction reaction, so I'll scribble that out. Um, of your metal and halogen via a redox reaction. So let's scroll that. Direct reaction, not direction reaction. It's like, what the heck was I saying there? 
So we can take some cadmium, for example, and react it with chlorine gas, and we make cadmium chloride. Maybe we'll take some gallium in the liquid forms, it melts pretty easily, with some liquid bromine, and we form gallium bromide. Um, now, one thing that you might have to do, like if you, um, if you have a metal that has multiple oxidation states and you want your product to only have a cert to only to be a certain one, you may have to control the stoichiometry. Um, for instance, if you want tin two chloride instead of tin four chloride, then you need to for tin two chloride have a one to one ratio of tin to Cl two. So, for instance, we have our solid tin, give it some Cl two in the gas form, and you get tin two chlorine chloride SnCl two. Um, but if you wanted tin four, then you would need to react this with two Cl twos. That will give you tin four chloride SnCl four. So the stoichiometry can definitely matter. Now, if you take an active representative metal, and just a reminder, an active metal is easier to oxidize than hydrogen. Um, these can react with gaseous hydrogen halides and produce metal halides and hydrogen gas. Um, these metals can also uh, react with aqueous forms of uh, the hydrogen halides and they'll produce hydrogen gas and a metal halide solution. So for instance, if I take uh, some cadmium and I react it with some HBr aqueous, so I'm gonna start with an aqueous example. I get uh, aqueous cadmium bromide and hydrogen gas. Oh, I need a drink, sorry. All this talking makes me thirsty. Uh, where was I? And then on the other side of things, if we have zinc and we wanna react it with uh, HF in the gas phase, so we're doing a direct reaction here, we can make zinc fluoride and hydrogen gas. So similar reactions. Now hydroxides, carbonates, and some oxides can react with solutions to form halide salt solutions. Uh, for example, we can look at calcium carbonate and HCl. So we take sol solid calcium carbonate, throw it into some aqueous hydrochloric acid, and we form calcium chloride with carbon dioxide and water. Calcium carbonate is Tums or chalk. So this is essentially what is happening uh, what just happened? That was weird. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the reaction that happens in your stomach when you take something like a Tums. So you're neutralizing the stomach acid to form calcium chloride, salt, carbon dioxide, and water. So um, in case you guys haven't noticed, instead of me directly writing on my slides and doing this through PowerPoint. Uh, my last three sections, I'm re doing a voiceover because somehow my microphone apparently came unplugged and I didn't know it, so I had no audio. So instead of going and rewriting and redoing everything, I'm just voicing over it. And as you can see, my computer's sometimes weird. Apologies. Um, now, many of our halides do occur in nature. Um, you know, sodium chloride is a big one, as is magnesium chloride. Um, you can find them in the ocean, or there's salt mines, salt deposits. Um, here's a picture of mercury iodide that forms when we mix some uh, potassium iodide and mercury nitrate. I don't know why this is randomly in here. Um, there you go. I guess it's showing you a mercury iodide compound. Um, here's a tunnel for a sodium chloride mine. Um, this is in Klodowa salt mine in Poland. I know I said that wrong. <laughs> so apologize if any of you speak Polish or Polish. I'm sorry. Um, we also have an interesting uh, species called interhalogens, and these are formed from two or more different halogens. 
So the heavier halogen is in the center, and it is bonded by single bonds to an odd number of uh, the of atoms of the lighter halogen. So, um, for instance, fluorine would be the lighter halogen with any of them, um, and fluorine is so strong it can make iodine oxidize to a seven plus oxidation state. Um, it can bring bromine and chlorine to five plus. Many of these inner halogens are unstable and pretty much all of them are very, very reactive. Um, there's a table at the bottom showing you some of the inner halogens. Um, we also have what are called ionic polyhalides of alkali metals and these are very closely related to the inner halogens. So you have an anion that has at least three halogen atoms attached to it. Here's some structures of um, some of these inner halogens. On the far left is IF3, which is T-shaped, IF5 is square pyramidal, and IF7 is pentagonal bipyramidal. So you can just see their shapes. Um, the halogens have a lot of different applications. Uh, fluoride and fluorine compounds have a lot of uses. One of the main ones being replacing freons, which are CFCs, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, and re replacing them as refrigerants uh, with hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or HCFCs. So um, these are less reactive with um, in the atmosphere and don't screw up ozone as much. Uh, we also have Teflon that is a polymer composed of uh, CF2, CF2 unit. So Teflon is the nonstick coating and a lot of cooking cookware. Fluoride ion is added to water and toothpaste to fight tooth decay. Uh, chlorine is used for bleach, uh, especially for wood pulp and cotton cloths. And my computer is doing a weird thing again. Why are you doing this, computer? Um. It's also used for chlorinating hydrocarbons and for producing polymers, as well as uh, killing bacteria in water supplies. Bromine is uh, used for dye production, as well as in sedatives, such as sodium bromide and potassium bromide. It used to be used in photographic films uh, in light-sensitive silver bromide. Not so much anymore, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, iodine is very much used as an antiseptic, so a lot of times you hear of tincture of iodine. Um, it's an alcohol solution that has potassium iodide in it. Um, it's also used for thyroid gland function. So our bodies need very small amounts of thyroid of uh, iodine to function properly. Um, so iodized salt is not a good thing to have on hand and cook with once in a while. It gives you the iodine that your body needs. Um, Interestingly enough, if you there's someone who has like an, a hyperactive thyroid, for instance, my mother had a hyperactive thyroid, um, and so she had to take a medicine to keep it from working too much, to, working overtime. Um, but if treatment doesn't work or they need a more advanced treatment for it, um, radioactive iodine is given to the patient to basically kill their thyroid without having to remove it. Uh, my grandmother had her thyroid fully removed, and so um, though people who have either had it removed or have had to take the radioactive iodine usually have to take what is called synthroid, synthetic thyroid, um, to keep their body functioning properly. So grandma had thyroid problems, my mom had them, I'm just a sitting duck waiting. <laughs> um, it's, iodine's also used in cloud seeding um, and silver iodide, and it's time for a mini rant from me. First you should know how clouds form. You have water vapor in the atmosphere and it has to condense on something to form a cloud and there's other conditions and stuff but the big thing is you need a seed for that water to grab onto and then more water can continue to condense onto it. Kind of like uh, your mirror in, when you take a shower it comes out covered in um, steam. Same type of thing. Or not steam but water, water. So that gaseous water grabs onto something that it can stick to and condense on. So um, this happens naturally, which is where natural clouds come from, from like emissions from plants. Um, you can also get compounds from automobiles or what are called volatile organic carbons that are come off as gases and then react in the atmosphere to form particles, which are solids or liquids that then water can condense on. Nonetheless, you have these different sources and then water can condense on it to form droplets. You get enough droplets, you form a cloud. So the whole thing with cloud seeding is putting uh, this in the air so that way the water can condense and form clouds and maybe rain and help the climate in areas. But the problem is for some place like California, Southern California, we don't have that much water vapor in the air. You can put all the seeds up there that you want, but if there's no water vapor 
to condense so there's not enough to form like good big clouds, it's not gonna matter. And even if you form clouds, there's probably not enough water to continue to condense to where it eventually rains out and cools things down. So yeah, <laughs> there's my rant. <laughs>